and welcome. Uh, we are live. This is the Atlas Project. This is a weekly chapter by chapter reading group about Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. And tonight we are discussing chapter seven of part three. This is John Galt speaking. This is the, in some sense, the moment we've all been waiting for. It's, it's John Galt's climactic speech to the world. Uh, and it's going to reveal a lot about Rand's uh, philosophy as such, not just uh, so tonight, it's not just a literary discussion. But before I say any more, uh, I want to give just a few announcements. The first is that a big reason that we are sponsoring the Atlas Project at the Ayn Rand Institute is to raise awareness about our essay contest about Atlas Shrugged. In the comments section for this post on Facebook, I've included links to information about the essay contest, which uh, deadline for which is in uh, in May. You can win up to ten thousand dollars for that. Uh, one last announcement, which is that we're going to be splitting our discussion of Galt's speech into two parts. We're uh, doing roughly the first half this week and second half next week. Next week I'll be in New York uh, with Greg, so we won't have some of these technical problems. Um, and uh, I'll say a little bit more about the logistics of that after giving you a quick summary of the parts of this chapter that are not in the speech that to the plot elements. So the, the main event, of course, is the speech. But for about eight pages before the speech, a little bit of plot action. First of all, we, of course, find out that Reardon has definitely quit. We find out about this as Dagny finds out about it, getting the news from Jim and uh, learning about some of the social consequences of Reardon's having quit. It, causes chaos, in short. Uh, Dagny thinks about the significance of all of this, and in particular about what it means for her position in the world, since she's, of course, decided to uh, come back from the valley and not go on strike. This is particularly pressing to her as she considers the message that she's gotten from Francisco, an exceptional piece of information that's been delivered by the strikers. Uh, shortly after this, the government announces that Mr. Thompson, the executive, is going to go on the air to give a report on the world crisis. Dagny is pressured to attend, but resists appearing on the broadcast so as not to uh, as not to appear to support it. At which point, of course, famously, Galt takes over the broadcast and uh, speaks for ninety minutes. Uh, let me just tell you about a couple of resources we're going. Well, let me say first just what our agenda for tonight is going to be. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time on the stuff in the chapter that happened prior to the speech. Um, then we're going to spend a fair amount of time on the structure of the speech and purpose of the speech, uh, sort of what's going on in this speech, why Galt is giving it, uh, and uh, topics of this nature. Um, first the purpose and then structure. Uh, and then we're going to uh, discuss the first part or two of the speech. We'll see how far we get. Uh, and then we'll resume next time just talking about the rest of the speech. Uh, and before we get into that, let me tell you a little bit about, um, let me tell you a little bit about the, um, uh, sorry, I'm just changing an audio setting, a little bit about the, um, some resources that I think are really helpful on the speech and that Ben and I have been making a lot of reference to to prepare for this. So um, the first is I'm forever uh, forever pushing uh, this book, Essays on Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, edited by Robert Mayhew. Uh, there are three things uh, really helpful on the speech in here. One is a chapter by Ankar Gatte on... Uh, uh, some, uh, some one is a chapter by Ankar Gatte on, uh, I just am forgetting the name of it, so I might as well just read out the name, The Role of Galt's Speech in Atlas Shrugged. And a lot of what we're going to be talking about early on today is uh, connected to that. Another piece in here that's of great value is by um, my old professor and friend, Alan Godhelf, who's no longer with us, called Galt's Speech in Five Sentences and Forty Questions. And uh, that's a, basically a study guide to the speech that Alan devised. And the way he did it was he kind of went through for each paragraph and summarized the paragraph in a sentence. Then he put those sentences into paragraphs, summarized each of those in a sentence, and kept going until he was down to five sentences. And he um, showed the resulting five-sentence uh, version of it to Ayn Rand, who said, oh, that's basically right, and suggested one or two changes. Uh, and the version with those changes is what's published in the book. Um, and then the 40 questions is just a study guide to um, detailed questions on particular parts to help you 
uh, to help you better understand them. Um, and we looked at some of those questions in, in preparing our, our thinking about this. Then the third thing that's in there that's useful is a very detailed outline with table of contents of the speech that I prepared some years ago, starting from Alan's um, five uh, sentences as, his, as the main outline points and then filling in sub-outline points and giving the page numbers for each part. So if you're trying to navigate your way around in the speech, uh, I find it useful. Uh, I found it useful in preparing for this. Then the other thing I wanted to recommend as a, um, recommend as a resource on the speech is um, there's a piece, uh, Ankar's piece in here, Ankar Gatte's piece, on, is based on a course that he gave at an objectivist conference some years back uh, on Galt's speech. I think it's called A Study of Galt's Speech. And that course contains more material than is in the essay, and you can uh, get that course online as an audio thing. You can download for a few dollars. I forget what it is, at, at the Ayn Rand bookstore. OK, so I had just um, recommended our, our uh, resources. So let's get into the, um, uh, into the uh, meat of the chapter. And let's just start with um, the aftermath of, uh, of Reardon's disappearance. That's really what we're seeing in the first part before the speech. And we'd asked a question about how people reacted to this. And I thought we got some, uh, some good answers to this question um, about different characters' reactions. So Ben, do you want to share those with us? And you had some thoughts about them too, I think. Sure. Uh, so uh, different people focused on different reactions to Reardon's having quit. So start with Jim. Uh, Jim's is the first that we get. And uh, he's, of course, the one who's delivering the news about Reardon's quitting in the first place. Schuyler describes him as having a whiny tirade, which is uh, characteristic of Jim, of course. Uh, Anna talks about why he's having this tirade, that he's panicking because he knows that everything about the looters' schemes up to this point uh, has depended on Reardon, and now Reardon is gone. And that's probably part of the reason why uh, we get some of the reactions from many of the other characters uh, in this section as we do. Dagny's reaction is also something people talked about. Schuyler says that Dagny is happy, of course, because Reardon has escaped from the world of the looters, but she, the way he puts it is that she feels anguish about the reason that he left. I suspect what he's getting at is something uh, that Anna commented on. Anna says, Dagny's happy, but still plans to stay herself, uh, and describes her as being in a strange and unstable position because of this. She's cheering Reardon's decision to have quit, but not doing it herself. Um, and you know, one thing that I think maybe uh, stimulates this ang anxiety a little bit further is the fact that she then gets this letter from Reardon uh, about having met Galt. And notably, this leads her to wonder if, does this mean Galt has now left New York? They're kind of leaving her behind. Uh, she's described as having been motivated by Galt's presence in the city, even if they weren't going to be together. And now he's possibly gone. And I think this is something that's important to remember when we are considering her reaction to the speech that's to come. That, that uh, is going to at least tell her something about uh, what Galt is thinking at the time. And then last of all, a number of people commented on society's reaction uh, more generally to uh, Reardon's disappearance. Uh, Dan says that uh, notably Oren Boyle is now against the steel unification plan. Of course, of course he doesn't get to use it to, uh, to loot Reardon anymore. David points out that suddenly ordinary citizens have become aware of Reardon in a way that they weren't before because he's gone. Uh, and Dagny reflects on this thinking that their attention is more open to disaster than it is to positive value. Yeah, that last point interests me because it's um, similar to Reardon's family's perspective on him, right? They don't value him when he's there. Uh, but it's only when maybe he's about to leave that suddenly they care about him and they uh, want him back. And Reardon interprets that as showing that they don't want to live, right? Um, so I, I find that fact interesting and the fact that Dagny's noticing that interesting as a possible step along the process of her reconsidering this idea of um, whether the people who she assumes want to live want to live. Robert, did you want to say something on this? Yeah, I agree with all that. There's also the media's reaction. 
that Reardon is actually still alive, he's still working, and we get all this, all these stories, it's wrong to think this, it's unpatriotic he, to think that. Or he's dead, uh, yeah. died in a car crash. Yeah. Someone, I forget, fake was news. it Tyler, uh, um, Skyler fake Ross, fake news. someone yeah, online sure. commented on this being fake news. Um, yeah, an unfortunate uh, word that now means everything and nothing. But, um, but uh, yeah, these uh, propaganda stories. Though I should um, mention, Greg, uh, I think it's interesting that at the same time, in spite of the, the propaganda, this is when the government finally decides to have Thompson's broadcast to acknowledge that there's a crisis in the world and they feel the need to you know, give their side of the story, at least. But this is this is a concession of sorts on their part, if you think about it. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that brings us to our, our next topic is what are the circumstances in which this speech is being given, right? Galt is taking over an occasion where there's meant to be a speech by Mr. Thompson that everybody is going to uh, see, right? It's been advertised all over the place. There's been a lot of propaganda for this. It's going to be on every radio station and every television station, wherever radio waves can still be heard. Um, and uh, Galt's now taken that over. So part of the context is what has led Mr. Thompson to give this speech. And I think um, the level of concern uh, about how bad society is and where things are going is a big part of that. And Reardon's disappearance, I think, Ben, you're right, is is a part of that. Um, any further thoughts on the 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 reason for Mr. Thompson giving this speech, on the propaganda advertising this speech, since that formed some of the context for this? Okay, then let's... Um, move on to the uh, to the issue. Why is Dagny there? So Jim tricks Dagny into coming, right? He tells her there's going to be a conference before the uh, on the world crisis before the speech. Turns out the conference starts at 7.30 and Mr. Thompson's supposed to be going on at 8.00. It's just not much time for a conference. But okay, she, she grudgingly shows up taking Eddie Willers with her as a kind of bodyguard. But why in fact do they want her there? Yeah, Alan. So she can give the appearance of sanctioning these looters' plans. Yeah, she's meant to be part of the broadcast. She says when um, when Jim, you know, asked her to come, they don't want me to be on air, do they? And she said, no, of course they won't let you near a radio microphone after last time. But what they want is for everybody to be seated around like a big happy family, and she's supposed to sit next to Mr. Thompson, the other person on the other side of uh, of her of Thompson being Robert Stadler. Someone online adds, as he just did, um, for moral sanction, right? Go ahead, yeah. And I wanted to add on, um, before the speech, there, um, there's a quote that, um, from the media that Mr. Thompson will put an end to the sinister forces. He will bring light to the darkness of the world. <laughs> he's the savior of everybody. Yeah. And that brought to me, to my mind, the image of Napoleon on his imperial throne with the light behind him. <laughs> yeah, these are kinds of images you, um, you get people, um, uh, dictatorial or tyrannical types or people who want to present themselves as saviors. Although part of what's interesting about Mr. Thompson is he's an odd choice for that, right? Mr. Thompson isn't a bold and self-confident, daring, so he doesn't um, put forth that image like you imagine. I don't know what Napoleon was really like, but images of Napoleon are heroic and so forth. Mr. Thompson's like a little weaselly guy and he's, he's you know, Thank you, nice to meet you, Mrs. Ted. You know, like uh, like another voter back home. And um, Rand's notes suggest that some of his mannerisms were, were mannered after Harry Truman, so a kind of folksy uh, politician. Um, so it's interesting um, that we're getting both of these dimensions to the same same character. I always thought that that line was like a, the idea of like a you know, solve the world's problems. It's kind of like a, the author's way of like, the speech will be that because it'll be end up being Galt's speech, and that's what it would. Uh, yeah, speech. but I mean the the Chick Morris in the Morale Conditioner or whoever wrote the propaganda didn't know Galt was coming. Yeah, so, but it's like, it's not like the, um, the the section where it says it all depends on who you know. Who you know? Yeah. Who, oh yeah. So it, it's. So I think these the kinds of things where the author has an extra meaning. Yeah. To it, um, there has to still be a logic to it within the 
motives of the characters in the story who are doing it. But then we have this extra layer. Um, and I think a few people online, Ben, commented on this, that Galt's speech does a lot of the things that Thompson's speech promised to do. That was me. That was me so in the notes. Com- who said that? Someone commented on it, but it was you. Uh, good. Well, we'll take a look at the particular ones as we get to that. On the, on the matter of uh, why Dagny is there and um, how she, you know, they, they need her sanction, of course, she's refusing to give it. She's refusing to go on the air. And before they can really uh, argue about it, the broadcast gets interrupted. I think it would be interesting to know or find out what would have happened if they hadn't gotten interrupted. What would they have done? to her. And my sense is that they didn't have anything up their sleeve, really, because it, it strikes them as, as surprising that, that she's still refusing. And she, and she says the same thing. She says, wouldn't you, have, um, you know, what did you think I was going to do? And uh, I, this, to me, kind of underscores how they really are not in control. They, they, they don't have a plan. This is, uh, this is not um, some kind of omnipotent Napoleonic, you know, power that's in control of things here. Uh, and I think maybe that connects to some of the other things about the state of the society that they're in right now. You can see things are falling apart more generally in this society. It's not like 1984 super totalitarianism. Um, the states are seceding. There's gang warfare in the streets. Uh, the, the, the government nominally has all the power in the world, but things are going to pot. Just a couple of quick points. Uh, it, uh, in addition to what Alex uh, said about they were looking for her sanction, they were deliberately seating Thompson in the middle between science and industry, as though uh, Dagny and Stadler are moral equivalents. And they just see them as figureheads because they don't grasp like what the minds behind what they're supposed to represent, even though Stadler, of course, is now intellectually and morally bankrupt. But Dagny is not the moral equivalent of Stadler. She's like, I'm not participating in this. So it's more than just the sanction. It would be like, she's the equivalent of Stadler, except yeah. from industry, and she refused to. And by refusing to do that, had the broadcast gone forward, they would have been forced either to reveal that they are not in control or bared their teeth and forced her to stay. And they wouldn't have wanted that to be seen on television either. Yeah. So she would have put them in a position to give up their game in one direction or another, totalitarianism or anarchy. And neither one of them do they want anybody to see. So Yeah, there are several good points there. I mean, uh, start with the first of the ones you said, that um, science and industry, but they don't really think about, I mean, when Thompson met Stadler, right, which was at the unveiling of Project X, he didn't care about him. He looked at him like... Uh, you know, some kind of object that was kind of vaguely interesting, but he didn't have any actual genuine respect for him. So he's representing science here, and Thompson wants him to represent science, but he's like a totem, like a like a mascot, but it's not, here's a guy whose mind I respect. And likewise, Dagny, um, and when he, when she says she won't sit where he wants him to sit, uh, he will have to bare his teeth or something eventually, but his first reaction is just you know, like if one of the pieces of furniture said it wouldn't do what it would do. Uh, he just thinks of her as a, you know, a thing to be shoved around. And before we get to see what decision he'll make about maybe they'd, uh, they'd um, upgrade Mr. Moen or something and have her sit there. Uh, but what, whatever, before we get to see that, we get the um, signal is jammed, right? And it, it transpires they can't get on the air. And here I think the last thing to talk about before we get to Galt's speech itself is the reactions to the signal being jammed. And we get reactions, well, I mean, does anybody have any thoughts on those reactions? We get reactions from, from three people, from Thompson and uh, from Stadler, and to some extent from the engineer. Yeah, Mohammed. Oh, are we speaking of uh, when the voice comes about? And no, not about? that, just um, the engineer comes to Mr. Thompson and says, you know, I don't think we're gonna be able to get on the air. Uh, there's been some problem, there were these radio waves of a... Uh, yeah, comment about that is, is that Thompson's response is, is sort of a kind of like Jim's uh, when it came to the crisis with Hank, which is not really interesting what actual technical problems are and how you could sort of like knowing that how, what you can actually do just to sort of like a we'll fix it like somehow. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, this goes to something Carrie Ann was saying too because it's not 
he bares his teeth, right? I'll put the whole trial on profession. Yeah, whatever. Uh, did you want to say I was going to say that exact quote. Go ahead. He, Thompson responds with anger. He says that he'll fire all the engineers, just do something as if something could be done. He, they don't understand what's going on, and it's very emblematic of his ideology as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all he's got is he could try to force these engineers, but they don't know how to do it. I mean, you could tough and puff, but what are they going to do? They don't know how to do it. Iris? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's very similar to the conversation before the train went into the tunnel and there was an explosion. Mm. Same thing, just do it. Just do it and no concern about how or even whether it's possible. Yeah. And in different ways, yeah, so I, I think we, we're seeing this a lot. The engineer is kind of perplexed. What do you mean I can't do it? And there's one other, what do you mean we can't do it? You know, he seems confused as to why he's being yelled at. He's just, you know. Um, and one other person has a reaction, which is that they say what it is, right? It's it, the state, we call it the State Science Institute. Everyone's looking into it. It's radio waves of a frequency no one's seen before, which. I don't understand the science of, but um, but anyway, it's it's radio waves that are unusual and um, and uh, of a frequency no one's ever seen before. Maybe it's a natural phenomenon, but the State Science Institute says it looks man-made. And who has a reaction to that? Yeah, Alex. Sadler says there's no such thing. There's nobody on Earth to make it, as if he knew all the men on Earth. Yeah, or knew that there were no mines on Earth, and he's. But there's a panicky, like hostility to that. Kind of like the uh, sort of reminds me of Sadler saying, "Got to yeah, be dead." Same exact mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're getting. I'm getting in both ears this same point. Ben is saying it, and you guys are saying it here, uh, saying he's got to be dead. And when we hear the voice come over the radio speaker, right, we get three reactions to it. And there, um, I actually didn't write out this quote. It was, oh no, it was, okay, so Dagny, Stadler, and Eddie, and I think this is the moment where we actually kind of supposed to connect that Eddie was the... If you hadn't before, word. yeah. One of triumph, which is Dagny's gasp, yeah. um, Eddie has a sound of bewilderment, and I forget what Stadler does. It looked like he got slapped in the face. Yeah, it looked like he got slapped in the face. There we go. <laughs> and then uh, no, Dagny and Stadler look at each other, and no yeah. one notices Eddie in this situation for... Unnoticed Eddie. Okay, so now we're into the speech, and uh, we want to think about why Galt is giving this speech. Right, this is the main event of the chapter. Um, we asked a a question online about why he's giving the speech, and there are a couple of parts to why he's giving it. Who is he addressing? Why does he want to address these people? And you know what is he saying to them? And a lot of that we'll see by looking at the structure of the speech. But let's just start with the issue of who is he addressing. Um, we asked a question about this online. Uh, one thing we can turn out is there are clearly points of the speech in which he's addressing particular people or, or fairly narrow demographics, right? There are a few, can you hear me so-and-so, and in some cases he actually uh, calls out names. So um, he uh, is addressing his fellow strikers in a few moments. Do you hear me, Francisco Danconia and Ragnar Danistuel? Do you hear me, Hank Reardon? At a couple of places, he's addressing the characters he thinks are evilist, and he addresses Robert Stadler by name, who, recall, he's told Daphne is his worst enemy. Um, at a few places, he's, um, he is uh, speaking to um, virtuous characters, people who are potential strikers or would be people who he would have actively recruited for the strike. In one case, he's talking specifically to Daphne, do you hear me, my love? But even more generally than that, that's part of a section where he's talking to what he calls hidden heroes. So presumably that's people he doesn't know about, but who are like Daphne, who if he did know about, he would be actively pursuing for the strike. But the sense is that, that these, um, talking to these most evil characters like Stadler, or talking to the strikers or people who are of the category that he would have actively recruited for the strike, that seems to be the exception in the speech. There's another demographic that most of his remarks are are toward. And there's some question as to to who they are. And um, one one suggestion that came up is that maybe his uh, who he's talking to 
is the uh, the leaders of the looters and the kind of people who propound the morality of sacrifice. And there was some discussion of this possibility on the forum. I thought some good things came out of that. Ben, do you want to take us through that material? Uh, well, you reorganized the, the, the notes here, yeah, so I'm not sure. Do you Dan mean Dan and David, I mean? Right. So uh, uh, Dan started out by suggesting that it, that it was the leaders of society who were, uh, you know, in, in effect, the looters that Galt was wanting to address. And it's true that there are lines in the speech where he seems to be speaking to them directly. But David thought that uh, Galt wouldn't want to waste so much time with them, 90 minutes of a speech. And besides, why would you know you expect them to be listening carefully anyway? That was that was one of the discussions. It's, it's a three hour speech, right? So it's, uh, I don't know. Uh, 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 yeah. So yeah, okay. there's quite a lot of time. Also, I don't, I think um, in the discussion form and in your kind of reiteration of it, we were treating these leaders of society and the looters as the same people. But I don't think that's right exactly. I think the class of looters is a lot wider of a class than the Mr. Thompson's Wesley Mouch, um, Orrin Boyles. Uh, I, I think all the people who are getting something for nothing through force uh, and who want to be count as looters, whereas the leaders of the society are the ones who are you know, actively disseminating this plan and working to make this if this kind of world and um, but I think it's it's not the case that who Galt is talking to most and most particularly is the leaders and the people who are promulgating this morality of sacrifice because Galt often refers to those people in the speech but almost always in the third person and he rather than the second person and he tends to refer to them as your teachers your leaders your etc so He's primarily ref talking to people who are in some sense um, influenced by these people who he calls your teachers, your whatever, the promulgators of this morality, um, and who are in some sense intermediate between them, who are the baddest of the bad, and the strikers. And it's the, there's a lot to say about the nature of this intermediateness. It seems like we have some hands in the room. Um, are out. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the things that occurred to me as I was reading the speech was <clears throat> I had to do uh, a lot of work on some sections of it, although even though I've been familiar with the philosophy for years, then I asked myself, the people who are listening to the speech don't have anything written mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to go over. This is all radio over the air. What, is, what does Gold expect uh -huh. from his listeners? What does he expect them to take away from this uh, lengthy speech? Uh, Good. Are his expectations higher, say, than say my, my expectations today for the general public? Mm -hmm. It seems to me that they are. We should look as we're going through for particular points where he expects them to make a decision or to have a position or something. Uh, Earl, did you want to come in on that? Well, I want to say something I consider very unimportant, but it just struck me, and I thought I would slip it in. This is like a Winchester off the stagecoach window. Don't let us throw it off. But um, I would just say, I remember a discussion one time, and I said something about a village Milton, and someone said, there are no village Miltons. And I thought, wow, that's really true. So I would say the same thing right here. There really are no hidden heroes. Okay. There aren't any. That's all I want to say. It's not even, but it's just, you know, a little comma. Mm -hmm. uh, Mom? I was going to mention that I think he's speaking to the general public, presumably the audience, and I never even questioned that he was speaking to the general audience, to the, to the general population um, of, of the country. So if we think of him as speaking to the general population, the same question of what kind of person is he talking to arises. Um, because there's a question of what kind of person is does he think the general public is? Well, how about the people, the, I think the same people that were at Hank Reardon's trial. So with those two waves that they, wave of, they, they don't defend him enough, but you know, they see him do something cool and you know, they, they have this emotional response. Um, and it wouldn't make sense to speak, give this speech to anyone else, honestly. He gives this speech to people that he thinks are 
in a sense, this is a speech he gives people to go on strike. So, and he ends with a, uh, a call, a similar call. Mm -hmm. So he has to see some good in them. That, that narrows down. So it's not like he's talking. A, it's not a direct uh, speech to Thompson. It's not like for him. Mm -hmm. But it was probably for the general American population. Carry on. Yeah, I think he explicitly says it in a couple of places. To whatever remnant of humanity, whatever reason or bit of heroic is in your soul, I'm addressing that. Whatever part of you is still reachable through my words, that's what he's expecting. Anybody who has a shred of the heroic, that is the, the reason, the capacity mm -hmm. to reason in them to hear this, that's what he's speaking to. And that, that's, the, that's the potential that resides person should they choose to actualize it. So I think that's who he's speaking to and, and hopes that those remnants will listen and will help create uh, a world that will be worth saving. Um, Alex, do you want to say something on this? Um, I agree with Mohammed. I think that Galt addresses the general public and under mm -hmm. that umbrella of the general public you have the leaders of the looters, you have just the average person who expe expect something for nothing. You have the people who are struggling to maintain some semblance of rationality mm -hmm. in a world that's falling apart. There's a broad array of characters within that spectrum. Uh, and Robert, do you want to uh, Yeah, <clears throat> two concretes I think of are Jeff Allen and Mr. Ward. Those are the kinds of people who are puzzled why the world is how it is, but they have honest intentions mm -hmm. and they would like some answers. Jeff Allen didn't have an answer to everything he went through at 20th Century Motor Company. Mm -hmm. So then I had a different question. Yeah. If we, if we could go back to why Gall gives a speech. Well, let, we haven't said that yet, so yeah. let's oh, come to that in a moment. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think you said that a lot. Right. So, yeah, I think we've covered most of the points, Ben, that you and I wanted to get at out about who the audience is, including some of the particular characters. I think Ward and Jeff Allen, you might think of as representing poles. They're not opposites of each other, but Jeff Allen's a much better person than Mr. Ward, at least at this point in it, but they're um, alike in matching the descriptions that uh, Carrie and Muhammad and Alex, you all gave. Uh, one topic that we were were uh, getting a lot of on online is um, this idea that is he addressing the honest people in society? And uh, David was saying that he was, and um, uh, Betsy was saying that that sounds more or less right, but then uh, uh, he talks about the evil which you all practice, which doesn't sound like he's talking about the honest people. It sounds like he's talking about dishonest people. And uh, I think we have to uh, talk about the, um, we have to think about the people he's addressing as mixed in some way, at least most of them as mixed in some way. And so you can say in one sense he's talking to the most honest people in society or the honest people in society. But I think the better way to put it, and Carrie Ann, this came out in the passage you quoted, um, the remnant of rationality within you, is he's talking to the best within each person or the, the honest elements within each person. And it's not the case that, you know, someone's either honest or dishonest prior to the moment where they have to make a choice to either look at the facts or not. They have a history of honesty or dishonesty which maybe um, inclines them one way or the other. But insofar as they're not, um, insofar as there's anything human left in them, they can rise to the occasion or flee from it. And he's talking to those, and there's, I think, a wide range of them who can rise to the occasion. And many of those people, I think he would count as looters. Right. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. So, uh, I mean, it's worth rem remembering, and we're going to get to this soon, that one of the big uh, topics of the speech itself is that this is the kind of thing that people uh, have choice about. And so they, it's possible for them to go back and forth and, and the comment that Harry wrote, I think, speaks to this, that in, in one way he's addressing uh, the listeners who cheer and stand guard at the passing of the John Galt line, but then when, the, it, when it matters, they don't want to stick their neck out uh, in the way that someone like Tony, for example, did. Um, so we're going to talk more about the... And, and I think somebody else uh, at the, uh, in New York also mentions the people at Reardon's court 
uh, at Reardon's trial. And remember, they cheer him, but then Reardon's thinking about how, you know, tomorrow they're going to endorse Orrin Boyle's uh, subsidies or something like that. So this is something that people do go back and forth about, and, and they, have, they clearly have the power to be more honest. Uh, and that's, I mean, it, at the very beginning, we get a description of Galt's voice, and it's, it's, the tone of his voice is described as that of a, not of addressing a meeting, but addressing a single mind. So he, yeah, he, I think he's speaking to the, the best within the, those people who are still left in the world, uh, however many of them there may be, and to the extent that they still have the power to make this choice. Yeah, I think that's that's really right. And um, it's, it's Muhammad here who mentioned the people at Reardon's trial, but Harry had mentioned it online. And um, I think Harry's um, the comment on it online was very good. He says, Galt um, addressing the capable individuals who support the creed of the negative characters in Atlas through their ignorance and their deliberate refusal to see. And then he, he points out that these are the people who cheer and uh, cheer at Reardon's trial and guard the passing of the John Galt line, but on the other hand, they don't stick their, no, their neck out in the way that Tony does when he's called upon to do it. Uh, a few things that have come across online just now, Ben, in the chats, and I can't see the names of who said them. I think you can, Ben, um, that are worth noticing. Um, one, somebody says, uh, asks why I said that... Um, that um, uh, Jeff Allen is better than Ward, and somebody else speculates that I was confused about who I was talking about. Harry. And that person is right. Um, so Robert said uh, Jeff Allen and, and Ward, and Ward's the guy who is, has the Ward's harvesters. And I agree that Jeff Allen and Ward are in the same category. The other person who I would say is, is conspicuously in the demographic being talked to, and who I confused with Ward for a moment, is Mr. Moen, who we see at that conference, and Mr. Moen is a pretty crummy guy, right? He's, um, we don't know anything really positive about him. He's, uh, except he's the one who was manufacturing signals of Reardon Metal, but then betrayed uh, Dagny and Reardon when it got too controversial to do it. Uh, and then when he got his fair share money, he started, uh, of Reardon Metal, he started doing other things with it. And we met him last when we saw, um, Owen Kellogg talking to him as all the factories were moving out of town, he was somebody who was supporting a lot of these bad laws, but who also, you know, unlike Jim Taggart, um, wasn't happy at the sight of destruction. He didn't take glee in factories going out of business. He felt kind of worried about it. And moreover, he took a kind of pleasure and, and um, comfort in seeing uh, acts of ability and competence. So this is someone who, whereas Jeff Allen and Ward are, you know, really like competence, and I'd say these are pretty good people. Uh, Moen's a pretty crummy guy, but it's not like he's all bad, uh, or all bad all the way. Something in him still likes seeing someone doing their job well. And I think that you can think of as representing the, um, the, uh, the range of them. Then somebody also said online... Um, Ben, who is it that referenced the guiltiest man in the room quote just in the comments a few moments ago? I thought that was really interesting. I don't see. Oh, it was Harry. Harry is... Uh, Harry, Harry again. Harry and I, here. you and I uh, think along the same track, it seems. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really good point, that if Reardon and Daphne are the best people in society, right... And if it's what Reardon's learned in going on strike is that it's his goodness being put in the service of the looter's code um, that uh, created all the trouble. Well, now Reardon's gone, and it's the people who are, like, you know, next in line for guiltiest in the room or guiltiest in the world that he's talking about. And with the exception of Daphne, they're not as people who have as much virtue to put at the service of the looter's code as did Reardon. But they have some, and it's only because of them that society is functioning at all. Uh, Earl? Yeah, I'd like to play off of Al's astute and wonderful point. I'll just iterate it. I think that Galt had to know that his speech was unabsorbable by anyone. If these were new ideas that people had not heard, they would be pondering that idea, working a little bit while Galt was carrying on, and in point of fact, then they would have lost the flow or a point like that. For the people that knew it, let's face it, three hours is, and Will will supply me the name I can't remember, but back when people used to give sermons of three hours and people would nod off, there was someone that would wake people up with a metal prod, right? Whatever well, that was. So there's a, there's a, 
an issue of you might need a study guide for this or to read it a few times and it wasn't published. But we're also, you know, in a novel that's not meant to be journalistic and natural. I mean, people speak in all novels, but especially in this one, in a much more polished way than they do. Francisco gives a you know, pretty well-written speech extemporaneously, and, I, uh, and people understand it or don't based on their character. And I don't think it sort of makes sense to ask about the, re the realism of that in the same way that it doesn't make sense to ask about the realism of in an opera, the fact that you know someone hits a really high note or something, in real life it would have happened differently, but it's a literary convention that it's done through more explicit speechifying. Right. Is Greg, I think this connects to the question of why he gives us speech. And we should move on to that. With Ben, we should move on to the question of why he gives the speech. And these are and these are related because if he's giving the speech for some reason other than for people to understand it, um, that that connects. So let's move on to that topic of what's Geralt's point in addressing people at this point in the novel. And Ben, uh, you want to share with us both your thoughts on this and some of the um, people online? Yeah, we well, we had a few people suggest reasons. Amber uh, made a comment about the timing of the speech uh, and that it was important that it occurs right after Galt has finally gotten Reardon. Uh, this was Francisco's greatest conquest. Uh, Amber describes him as the last tall pillar holding society together to fall, and now he's safely in the valley. So... Uh, Galt feels safe Galt in announcing as the, his presence. Galt the last him tall pillar, the greatest yeah. of the people he avenged. Oh, yes, right. Uh, Dan uh, points out that you know the Thompsons having this this big broadcast and has done all this advertising, so Galt might as well use that opportunity. And Dan, of course, remembers the one who initially suggested that that it was the leaders of the society that Galt was addressing. And, and I, you know, for everything that we've said before, I think that you can't entirely discount what Dan is saying here, because uh, even if the if the, the worst people in society aren't going to listen to this speech, the mere fact that it's given and that uh, they see that there is this opposition to them out there is, is going to weaken their resolve and it's going to uh, make them doubt themselves more. And that's a, another point that Dan makes, that uh, giving this speech makes them makes it harder for them to evade uh, all the other things that they've already been evading. Um, and, you know, so maybe what happens is, is Galt tells them off at the beginning and they tune out, but they, they've still been told off. Uh, and I think there's more reasons, too, and you probably want to talk about those. Does anyone locally have thoughts on these reasons? Carry on. Well, I want to disagree with Earl. I don't think that he would have thought that it was unabsorbable by anybody. Clearly, the best minds will grasp it and listen. Intelligent people are quite capable of listening for hours to other intelligent people. And if he's aiming to speak of the best within people, it's not like people are not going to pick up writing implements when they realize, oh my gosh, maybe there's something here. It grips them. Whatever they can absorb or listen to or are willing to, they've tuned in because they want to hear about the crisis. So anybody tuning in is already willing to listen to that which has not been named. Mm -hmm. They're going to be the people who are receptive to hearing somebody talk about the topic that they tuned in for. And in that respect, I, you, you don't attempt the the impossible, that's completely antithetical to what he stands for. He does think it's possible, and to whatever extent it is, people will get it to varying degrees. The best people will keep thinking about it when he's done talking. That's, uh, that's why, so I think he thinks there are, pe there are places and people to reach, and the ones who are willing to listen will do so, and the best ones will keep thinking about it, and that's the best hope. He's offering them the best hope out of this crisis situation. And he does give them, you know, he doesn't quite put it this way, like if you only take one thing away from my speech, take away this, but he does underscore and highlight certain things. And there's uh, the point that I was making before about the realism or romanticism or heightened reality nature of it is if the issue is, look, nobody could listen to something this dense for three hours and understand it all, uh, but they could if it were 45 minutes, then I think that's literary license of how long you, you know, how long someone's, how long a speech can be in a book versus... Uh, or how many times you need to 
pause to ask for questions or something. That's the kind of thing that I think is an issue of genre convention. But if the idea is nobody could understand a radical new idea and um, respond to a challenge in a situation where they're, they have the evidence all around them that they're in a really weird situation that this is naming, then I agree with you, Kerry, and Galt, Galt at least thinks it is, uh, it is possible. Robert, you'd want to say something about this too. Well, just as, as a plot point mm -hmm. that actually I didn't know the people who had submitted to uh, the idea about Reardon. So, so Galt was waiting for Reardon. He needed to have Reardon mm -hmm. on strike before he gave this speech. But also, he had to be ready to expose himself that, okay, now I'm going to be a marked man. So this is the climax of the, of the entire novel, is, is yeah. the speech. And mm -hmm. so the events are setting us up for that, that, that Galt is ready to take a stand, go public with his ideas. And the fact that Thompson has this platform readily available for him. Yeah. This is a you point that it. Ankar makes in his, uh, in his piece on this that I think is right. If Galt had gone public at the beginning of the strike, nobody would have been interested or cared because nobody would have thought this mattered, mm -hmm. right? Um, only fairly recently, after the disappearance of the Colorado industrialists, did people start to realize something's going wrong. Where did those bastards go, right? And since then, it's been dangerous. So maybe a month or two earlier, or even a year earlier, Galt could have accomplished something by gotten the public's attention by giving a speech and maybe convinced some people, which he couldn't have convinced 10 years earlier. But he would have been endangering his project. Now he's gotten everyone out except Dagny. And Dagny's chosen to remain and undertake additional risk. And um, right. So I think that's a big part of the reason. Yeah, Ben. Since you mentioned Ankar's uh, uh, Speech, uh, article about this, I thought another point that he makes is because of the fact that people are starting to notice, why are they starting to notice? It's because their society is in, in shambles. And in an important sense, this is because of Galt. And Ankar's argument is that the big part of the reason that Galt is giving the speech is because he owes them an explanation of what he's done. I mean, he's He's turned their world upside down, and uh, he liken, uh, Ankar likens it to the Declaration of Independence, um, that uh, you, know, they, you owe an explanation to a candid world uh, that has been affected by this revolutionary act. Good point. The, while we're, we're um, pushing Ankar's wares, um, that, that's a good point of Ankar recommending, likening the speech to the Declaration of Independence. There's also, for people who finished the novel, a really good lecture uh, called Atlas Shrugged as America's Second Declaration of Independence, which talks about the whole novel in the context of the Declaration. And I think it's really, um, really a good piece and really thought-provoking. And it's on the, the ARI YouTube channel. Good, yeah. Uh, Mohammed, do you want to say something else about Galt's motives for giving the talk? Yes, the, the purpose of the speech. Um, I think it's very important to notice that, uh, that he's putting it forward at a time where like everyone admits even the bad people say this is the worst point so far this is such mm -hmm. a low uh, because what I think he's doing what, it, what he mentions is he's trying to fix the world to make it such that they can finally return in the sense that like this strike is not mm -hmm. it's, it's not like a secession like you're like we're, we're apart from you forever they do if you want to live in an industrial world do this mm -hmm. So it's that type of, here are the steps. It's kind of like a practical piece also. It's like, do these, and then you get this type of world. And we want this type of world, so do it. And then we can come back and we can rebuild the nation. Good. So the strike, the, the speech is like the beginning of the end of the strike. It's like bringing the strike to the end. Now, we're going to talk a lot next time about how Galt envisions the strike ending and what it is that he does and doesn't want from people in the world. Because he, he doesn't come on to make terms with them, right, or to say, here's what we want and we'll come back if only you do this. Um, he asks them to join the strike in a way. But anyway, somehow he thinks this is going to precipitate the end of the strike. It'll, it, we're almost at the end now, and this will help the last tumblers fall. And then there's connected to that um, the issue of justice for everyone. Uh, ben, shall we move on to the structure now, or is there anything else uh, you want to add about the purpose? We should move on. 
I'm just going to say a little bit about the structure of the speech. And uh, I mentioned earlier uh, Alan Godhelf's having boiled down the speech to five sentences, which I find very helpful. Uh, I'll read you out the five sentences. But first, I'm going to um, put up uh, simpler than that even. Just I gave titles to the sections uh, based on these sentences. And uh, uh, just to help us know where we are, and for people in New York, I put this on the screen. You guys can't see it. But the five sections are uh, the introduction to the speech. Uh, the, the first section after that, I call the morality of life, then the morality of death. The, the fourth one, um, I can call your teachers or the mystics. And the fifth and final one, choose the morality of life. And it's, um, again, the introduction. Then you could have a second section, which I call our morality, the striker's morality, or the morality of life. A third section, which is your morality, the world's morality, or the morality of death. Then your teachers, that is, the teachers of the morality of death, or the mystics, another thing you might call these people. And then choose the morality of life. And let me read you the, the sentences that um, these are my, these titles are my main subheadings for the parts of the speech. And here are Ellen's sentences summarizing them. I think this gives a really good overview of the speech, so it'll help us think more about it. Uh, part one, the world is perishing from the morality of sacrifice, and the men of the mind are on strike against this morality, which is speeding up the process of destruction. Sentence two, the proper rational morality for man is one of life and reason based on the axiom that existence exists. Section three, the morality of sacrifice is the morality of death, for it demands the renunciation of that which makes life possible, the mind, and thus of any enjoyment of life on earth. Part four, this code is taught by men who, having renounced their mind, seek power over the consciousness of other men by attempting to convince these others to renounce their own minds and accept the morality of sacrifice. The deepest motive of these teachers of sacrifice is hatred of existence, of life, of man, of themselves, and their goal is to destroy their victims and themselves. And sentence five, these are compound sentences. Uh, <laughs> sentence five, if all men of reason reject, as we the strikers have, their doctrines of mysticism and sacrifice, realizing that no compromise is possible, and refuse to support them, demanding instead a society of rights and freedom, then the society of the mystics and looters will perish, and then we will have a world of reason, freedom, achievement, and joy. So those are uh, God Health's five sentences. Um, their longest sentences, and I'm reminded that once at a conference where uh, Alan and I were in a conversation with people, someone coined the term God Health sentence for a sentence with lots of clauses. But um, I do think that they're um, admirably brief in comparison to the speech. So as a, a summary of the speech, I think they're very powerful. And just these phrases that I've put up, I think, give a sense of how the structure of the speech works. There's an introduction where Galt talks about what's happening. There's a strike. The strike is bringing to its fruition a kind of end state inherent in the morality accepted by the world. Then there's a discussion of Galt, the striker's morality, which is contrary to this morality of the world and the thing that they're striking in name of. Then there is a discussion of the accepted moral code, which Galt thinks is a morality of death. Then there's a discussion of the kind of people who teach or promulgate this morality and why. And I'll, that one's a little bit complicated. We'll come back to that later. And then there's a, a, an issue of, well, which of these two opposite codes are you going to choose? And Ankar gives a little simpler version of the structure of the speech. Um, he sort of treats the introduction as something to put to one side because it's short. And he folds the, what I'm calling your teacher's portion, into the morality of death portion. And so if you think of it that way, the structure of the speech is really apparent and simple. It's the morality of life, the morality of death, choose. Here are your two options. What are you going to choose? And so there's a, a real advantage to that simpler way that Ankar um, characterizes it because you can really see you're being offered an alternative and pick between it. But I, I prefer structuring it along Allen's lines. You're thinking of the structure that way for two reasons. First of all, if we go uh, in this life, death, choose way of viewing the speech, the death section is just incredibly long. Um, and it feels lopsided. And second, a lot of the reason why people can't choose or having trouble choosing 
uh, people like Daphne, and is that they can't understand where this morality of death is coming from, or uh, why people function this way, what it is that motivates this. And so I think there's uh, the material that's in the morality of death section. I think Daphne would maybe not understand and agree with all of it perfectly the way Galt does, just like she wouldn't understand with and agree with perfectly all of the things in the morality of life section the way that Galt uh, puts it. She would probably say she agrees with it, but she wouldn't think it should be practiced like he thinks. But I think the material that she doesn't understand yet, the material that she needs to um, check and understand better, a lot of that is what's in this your teacher section. And that's a separate reason to think of it as, as separate. And now, Ben, you had some other thoughts on the, on the structure and how to think about these sections as breaking down, I know. Yeah, and I, just FYI for everybody, I, did, I put Alan's five uh, uh, compound sentences into the comments section uh, so that you could take a closer look for yourself. I did just want to point out in a recent uh, reading of the journals chapter on her notes on Galt's speech, I happened to notice something that suggested a third possible way of conceiving the outline. Uh, and if you take a look on pages, uh, between pages 650 and 653, you'll see uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, there's, a, there's a section in the journals when she's working on it. We, there are a bunch of kind of drafts of at different points in the, in the composition of the speech. And at one point, under the morality of death, she talks about uh, the morality of death and its consequences. And some of the consequences are personal, and some of them are social. At one point in the uh, journals, Rand uh, divides up her content on the morality of death into uh, the morality of death and its consequences, and then some of the consequences are personal and some of them are social. And um, a lot of the material that uh, I've classified under this, um, under this section of the, um, your teachers, the teachers of the morality of death, uh, corresponds to the social material, although not perfectly. Um, and all of these major sections have a lot of kind of excursions into related material in other sections. So there are uh, the um, there are different ways you can think of carving up the material. I think this five main headings way is overall the most helpful, although there's a certain special clarity you get to abstracting a little bit further and thinking of it as life, death, choose. Um, what we're going to try to talk about in the rest of today is the morality of life section. And if we have time, we'll get a little bit into the morality of death section. And next time, we're going to uh, talk a little bit more about the morality of death section, a lot about the teachers of the morality of death, that section, and a lot about the choose life section at the end, uh, which contains material and self-esteem. And for people online, um, Ben has posted links to, um, or posted the text of Alan's five paragraphs, which are really helpful. So we're moving on now to, um, to talking about the, um, the speech. And let's just say a little bit about the introductory section. Uh, I'll just make a few points about it, and then we'll turn into the, the content of the morality of life section. Uh, some major points that I think uh, come across. So first, the world... Uh, the state of the world is an effect of the world's morality and of the strike. And I think both of these elements matter. Um, the strikers, by withdrawing their minds from the world, have let the world's morality reach what's its natural and logical conclusion, a conclusion that it wouldn't have reached or wouldn't have reached quickly, wouldn't have reached within anybody's lifespan so that you could notice it happening um, it, without the strikers having hastened the progress by withdrawing themselves from the world. But there's another element to it, which is that this conclusion, this kind of horrible state of the world that results from following the world's dominant ideas, is not just some um, incidental bad effect of the world's uh, uh, um, beliefs, nor is it something that um, logically has to follow from them but is contrary to the purpose of these beliefs. Gold describes it as the ideal or goal of the world's moral beliefs, and indeed of his listeners' moral beliefs, his listeners being not just the preachers of these ideas, but the regular people who believe them. And we might want to think about why he thinks that, and also why he thinks, and we've heard him and Francisco and others say this in the past, 
why he thinks that what the strike is doing is granting the world's demands rather than, like normal strikes do, um, making demands of the world. So any thoughts from the New York locals or from people online on either of those two uh, issues? The two issues being, why is this horrible state of the world not just an effect of the world's ideas, but its goal or ideal in Galt's view? And how is it that what he's doing is granting their demands rather than you know, going against them? Uh -huh. Uh, sure, before that, I can just uh, mention a distinction between uh, s sort of Galt and, by extension, Rand's view, and something a lot of uh, modern, either libertarians or conservatives would say, which is that uh, there are certain policies that are good, you know, have good intentions, or in this case, morality has good intentions, but well, maybe uh, the means is just inappropriate or inadequate. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Galt perspective is, no, 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 like, the end state is fully in, like implicit in the actual uh, moral code. And uh, why he thinks that is, is because the moral code seems to uh, demonize the people he withdrew as uh, exploiters, so they don't wish to be exploiters anymore, so they withdraw as uh, unnecessary to the economic functions of the country, so they don't wish to be unnecessary anymore, as illusions in their philosophy, so they wish to not, you know, um, mm -hmm confuse anyone anymore and they withdraw themselves so it's it's the glorification of people who are not as competent as them at their expense that's the full goal of the morality uh, and that's why he thinks it has to lead to the current state of the world okay Earl yeah I would address the second issue you brought up Greg and that is that uh, I think from Galt's point of view, he sees that there's a charade involved. I will pretend I'm not this one. In fact, I am this, and that it's your behest, not mine, and I refuse to continue that charade. My mask is off. Here it is. Uh, that. And we've seen Reardon doing this before, this idea of we're not going to help you pretend. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and Galt put it, we're not going to blind you anymore. You know. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, Carrie Ann, did you want to? Uh, yeah. I think your second question was, why, how does Galt or why does Galt see himself as giving the world their demands? Because yeah. strikers normally make demands. And uh, essential to his worldview is he doesn't make demands on anybody. He puts out what's of value and you either choose it or you don't. There's no demand to be made. It's a choice. Yeah, okay, so that's why he wouldn't make a demand of them. He does give them ultimatums at some point, but they're not demands in, in the normal sense. And, um, but that, yeah, wouldn't show why he's, so that's really why he doesn't make them. As to why he grant, and why he sees what he's doing as granting them, I think we could add in some of the points Muhammad made to what you're saying, and we can, you know, flesh out the picture. Uh, they're demanding to be rid of certain evils. Right, which um, the strikers represent greed and materialism and uh, you know, better people have higher concerns, says Lillian. Well, I've taken away the people who don't have higher concerns, so they wouldn't bother you with them. Or else the, the striker, the, the world says, uh, people like him and Daphne and Reardon and Francisco don't really exist. There aren't real people like this. All right, so we won't be around if you think we're unreal. We won't, you know, trick you by seeming like we are, you know, something that can't really exist anymore. Um, so uh, in that sense, too, he's granting their demand. Uh, he thinks that what their ideas amount to is a mindless world, and what he's granted them is a mindless world. And when they look at the world, they don't like it. Uh, at least most of them don't like it. Some of them, it turns out, do get a kind of glee from this. But even they're a little bit afraid to acknowledge that this is really what they want, right? Um, um, but it is what they, this is what, what they've been asking for all along really looks like. At least that's what Galt's view is. And he's the one who sped it along and let them get it. There's one other big point from this introduction that's the sort of transition to... Um, uh, what I called section one the, or section two, the morality of life. And uh, that point is this idea that um, you, you moral cannibals, and I take it the people who he's calling moral cannibals, he's giving them lots of other names, are not just the mystics, the preachers of the morality of life, but everybody in society, or almost everybody. 
Um, you people, what you need is not to return to morality, but to discover it. And then in this morality of life section, he's going to tell them what morality really is, help them to discover it or give them the leads they need. Um, I think that's a really striking idea. And this morality of life section starts by giving some content that's relevant to that. Uh, what do you mean they need to discover morality? They talk about morality all the time. You and Francisco have said they have a code, their moral code. Gol goes on to call it the morality of death. Incidentally, that's Francisco has said before, Reardon, if yours is the code of life, what then is theirs? I kind of spoiled the big reveal when Galt says it at one point. I will now name for your hearing what you dread to hear, that yours is the morality of death. But this is what Francisco has been indicating all along, and it's pretty clear that that's what he was indicating since that's the opposite of life. Um, but in some sense, the people in the world have a morality, but in another sense, Galt says they need to discover it. And I think it's just worth underlining and then getting people's thoughts uh, on it. Um, what Galt says, even at the very beginning, before he goes into the morality of death of the topic, about what people have been taught about morality. And he says that they've known no concept but the mystical and the social of morality. And um, in both senses, a mystical morality in which morality consists of commands by God, or a social morality in which morality is about serving the needs of society. He thinks that on both of these views, morality is something imposed on someone by whim, whether it's the whim of a god who just decides it, or the whim of all the other people in society who decide what their um, public good is, or maybe of uh, Kafi Meggs, who turns out to be the one who decides what the public interest is, but someone's whim. And uh, he sees this, well, why is this, why would Galt think that someone who views morality in this way doesn't have a concept of morality, doesn't, have, doesn't know of any morality, is in some sense ignorant of morality? Any thoughts on that? Mom? Um, so when, when Galt discusses, discusses his positive morality, it's all about these different things a person has to value. Mm -hmm. um, and so if, and that's his conception of morality in general. Um, and so if a person's entire focus on, is on just giving up things, giving up values, it's, it's sort of like a, well, we don't care which value it is, or the focus we have on it is whatever it is, you know, just, just give, give it up, let it go. And mm -hmm. so morality seems to be concerned with what things you ought to value. And not just like w with the giving. So if you just focus on the giving, you don't seem to be putting much attention into uh, the actual things you want. Good. So there's this idea that what people think of as morality is focused on what not to do, what to get away from, but not what to go towards. Um, so it doesn't give you any positive advice, just negative advice. Um, somebody online, and I can't see who, um, says that the uh, the moral advice they get, whether religious or secular, is uh, arbitrary. It's based on whim. It doesn't give reasons for things. That's and if Jacob. we think that what that's Jacob thing. And what we if we think that what morality is meant to do is to give you a reason why you should pursue certain things rather than other, or act some ways rather than others, then someone who doesn't have any idea of there could be a reason for it, there's just someone wants it, whether it's my neighbor or God, um, would not have any concept of morality yet. And uh, carry on. You know, they also don't even know what the nature of it is. It's kind of like this floating, like I've heard this, people tell me morality is, they give them some content. They don't even know what it is, no less why they would need it. So they, they, they really have no clue. They just are like imitating what other people say and tell them to do. So they, yeah. they have no concept in mind and it's they don't know why they would even need to understand it. Yeah. This idea of people imitating things without any clue of them is something we've seen before in various ways in the book, right? So, you know, Jim Taggart wants to celebrate, but what he wants is an imitation of celebration, of an imitation of having something to celebrate. And a lot of people who think they want sex don't want sex. They just, they've seen that people do this, so they do it. And um, we get, uh, likewise, with people wanting money and luxury. There's something backwards about the way they want it. They don't have the thing that would make it meaningful. And we get... And when they are faking Reardon, 
When they were what reading? They were thanking Reardon, his uh, fellow industrialists. Uh huh. You know, he said it's like they heard from somewhere that they're supposed to honor people, and this is how they're supposed to do it. Uh huh. And they they're just going through motions. They don't understand that someone else had given meaning to, and they they're like a cargo cult of honoring Reardon. If people, uh, so this idea that people are kind of going through motions they don't understand of major things in life is significant. We're going to see in the this fourth section of the speech, this your teacher's section, Galt talk a lot more about that um, and talking about stealing concepts, um, which is a, the fallacy of the stolen concept is something Ram would go on to write about in her nonfiction. And I think um, that's very much what's going on here. There's, you use this word morality. Um, the facts that give it meaning are facts that uh, exist because of people like me, Galt, and Hank Reardon, and Francisco Danconia, but your, um, and that if you follow those facts through, they would lead to my morality. But you're still using the language of morals, um, I feel like hair suddenly, you're still using the language of morals, that's the title of a book by F. Uh the language of morals, Nobody got kinds that of words. But Carrie Ann got it. Um, but uh, she's also a philosophy <laughs> professor, so what are you going to do? Um, so um, the, uh, the, the words of morality, but not um, but uh, without the context that gives them meaning. Al, did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, w would you agree that the focus in the speech is somewhat different than earlier in the novel, where someone like Reardon who I think honest error confuses altruism and benevolence. Um, he says, yeah, I should be nice to my brother. I should be nice to my mother and my wife. But, you know, they're not as nice to me as they you know, as I'd like them to be, but um, I can, you know, I can adjust. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't know. I mean, Galt clearly has a less positive view of his audience than Francisco had of Reardon when Francisco was approaching Reardon. So in a sense, um, you know, Francisco approached Reardon sort of reverently and with this tone of tremendous respect as of somebody great who he profoundly values who's making a mistake. Uh, he doesn't call him you moral cannibal and things like this. Uh, on the other hand, right, Francisco strongly implies that Reardon is the guiltiest man in the room uh, and leads Reardon to that realization. Uh, he tells Reardon, it's against the sin of forgiveness that I wanted to warn you. So not like, hey, you might make a mistake and screw up and forgive someone, but the sin of forgiveness. So at a, a high enough level of abstraction, both Galt to the people in the world and Francisco to Reardon are using moralistic language uh, and saying, you're doing something wrong here. You maybe don't see that it's wrong, but it's wrong. It's immoral. It's unjust. And Galt does this to Daphne, too. Go on thinking that justice could be served by undergoing the most unjust of tortures. And, you know, things that are, you know, to just shake her up until there's some immorality in what she's doing of some kind. It might be honest, and yet there's something, there's a real guilt involved. Uh, and you will pay for your mistake and so forth. And um, so at some level, there's this kind of moralizing or moral tone, even when you think the person's error is honest and even when you respect them a lot. And that's in common between Galt in his speech and Galt and Francisco to Daphne and Reardon in previous encounters. But I think, nevertheless, there's a difference that it's with this tremendous amount of respect and love in the cases where they're approaching particular people who they love and see as paragons of virtue <coughs> with some little errors on the side, whereas here Galt is talking to the remnants of virtue and the remnants of the humans in people that, you know, by and large, he thinks pretty ill of. Uh, and so in that Greg, sense, he's more chiding. Yeah, Ben. On this question of uh, uh, discovering morality as opposed to returning to it, I think it's important to emphasize that later, slightly later in the speech, into the morality of life section, uh, around uh, page 1015, standard edition, page 929, paperback, uh, Galt explicitly says that uh, if you wish to know what I told people to make them quit, uh, I made them see it. I, br I brought them not a re-evaluation, but only an identification of their values. I, I always thought this sounded like a bit of a nod to Nietzsche saying, I'm not proposing a complete radical overthrow of the previous concept of morality. 
Uh, and so, you know, when you're emphasizing that he's saying, don't return to morality, discover it, I think it's important at the same time, he's not saying nobody's discovered it before. I'm only discovering it for the first time. And this connects to a conversation that we've had in recent months about uh, part, many of the conversations that Francisco has with Reardon about uh, showing how what he's doing uh, is in fact moral, much to Reardon's surprise, but uh, and, and then appealing to the very same kinds of ideas that were in the bones definition of morality, vision to see the truth, courage to do what's right. And there are places in Galt's speech in the next section that we're going to get to where Galt goes through some of these same ideas again. And I think that's part of the reason why he's saying this is not just a complete reevaluation. Uh, I mean, it's so I think there's a difference when when they're talking to Francisco and Dagny that when they're talking to the the worst and the less good um, people, that Francis, that that Dadney and Reardon are essentially moral, right? And so in some sense they've discovered morality, but haven't discovered it self consciously. They can't name it as morality, but they uh, are acting by these principles. They know these principles, but they can't fully name them, and they don't, especially in Reardon's case, recognize them as moral principles. So they are principles that they're committed to. Um, in the case of the the worst people, um, they don't, I mean, it's hard. some of them don't even have these principles at all. Others have them in moments. They glimpse them, right? And Galt refers to in that moment, if you could be what you were in that moment, in that moment, you've had the state of mind that I've never betrayed and I've had my whole life. Um, so it's not something that there's sort of never been any of in those people. But I think the, the worst people don't have enough of it to um, count as having a concept of morality or a code. Um, Dadney and Reardon have been living on the code of life, the morality of life, basically full-time with compromises and mistakes. Whereas the, the mixed people, and those are the people who are the heroes, and the hidden heroes is anyone else like that who maybe is not known to be like that, right? Maybe Galt hasn't met them yet. Um, but the other people who aren't heroes, hidden or otherwise, are people who might have moments or aspects or parts of their life where they live this way. But this kind of code of living isn't the dominant thing that they're doing in their life. It's not the dominant way that they're living. And um, whatever content they have about morality is just totally disconnected from that and um, Greg. stolen or floating, I think. Yeah, Ben? We're an hour and 20 in, so I think we should move to the next section. I agree, and I was planning on moving now. So let's, um, let's do that. And we are now talking about... Um, we are now talking about what on this outline I'm calling Section 2, The Morality of Life, which begins on page 1011 in the Standard Edition. And um, this begins again with this topic we were just talking about, about um, you guys have to discover morality. You've never known any concept of it but the mystical and the social. Um, and uh, why is it that Galt thinks that we need a code of values then? If, if the people who only know the mystical and the social codes of morality don't really know what morality is at all, they don't really have the idea of morality because they lack the idea of a reason why people need to act one way rather than another. They only think of whims, whether your own whim or God's whim or your neighbor's whim. But they don't have the idea of a reason that makes it necessary to live and act one way rather than another. Why is it that Galt thinks, what is the answer to that? Why is it that Galt thinks we need to act in one way rather than another? What does Galt think is the source of morality? And the reasons he gives have to do with um, the things that he thinks are like and unlike other living things about human beings. And so we had a, a question on this, Ben, question three that we had asked people. And do you want to review some of the answers that came out of that? Sorry, I don't. Um, okay. Well, we got a. I mean, there was there were not a lot of answers. There, there generally we didn't get a lot on the the philosophical questions. But um, Schuyler pointed out that uh, that uh, part of the answer to why we think why 
Galt thinks we need morality has to do with the ways in which we're like and unlike uh, other living things. Like other living things, we must act according to our nature. Unlike them, we have reason and we have to adapt our environment to our needs. Dan points out that unlike other living things, we don't act automatically for our own good. Uh, we can either confront reality or evade it or fake it. Uh, and that's something I, I want to say a few things about later, but you should go on. Okay, yeah. So I think there, there's uh, the two main facts are all living things must act in a certain way uh, that's within their nature in order to survive, a way determined by their nature. Um, but human beings are special and different from other living things in that the faculty, primary faculty by which we survive is reason, and unlike the various faculties involved in other animals' survival, reason doesn't function automatically. And I think these are the key, the key points for, for Galt. Um, one way to put this first point that living things need to act in a certain way in order to live, um, just in a phrase, is the conditional character of life. Life is conditional. A living thing won't live, won't keep living, unless it acts in certain ways. And so all living things have to act in a certain way to achieve certain items or conditions and maintain those items and conditions, which items and conditions the living thing needs to keep in existence. Um, items and conditions like food, you know, an environment of the right temperature, oxygen, water, etc. Um, and uh, indeed, this is what life is, according to Rand. Rand characterizes it, and Galt does, as a process of self-sustaining and self-generated action. To be alive is to be engaged in a process of action by which process of action you sustain and ge you sustain yourself, right? You keep yourself around as a living thing. If you're not doing that, you're not living. Uh, and, you, and any living thing that stops doing that will die. And it's this fact about life, that it has this conditional character, that it has this nature, that in Galt's view gives rise to the very concept of values the very phenomenon of values. There are only th such things as values in the world because there are living things, and this, values are part of a living thing's life process. Just like there aren't arms apart from creatures with arms that move around and manipulate things with them, there aren't values apart from living things that pursue values as part of their life process. And likewise, the word value has no meaning outside of the context of thinking about a living thing trying to live. A value, in general, is what something acts to gain or keep. But in order to understand the idea of acting to gain or keep something, you have to understand the idea of facing an alternative or of having something at stake. And that only applies to living things. Um, so the idea is that a, a value is the things that, living, that a living thing acts towards in the process of keeping itself alive. And something that's not like this just isn't a value. In no sense is something acting for it. If, if this isn't the context in which it's happening. Um, now, in non-human organisms, their nature sets them to pursue certain values, and those values sustain their lives. So in the case of a plant, it's programmed by nature to reach its roots out towards water and so forth, and those are the very things that the plant needs to do to get the water in order to live. Um, but human nature doesn't set us with a repertoire of things to go out and pursue. Um, yet, even though human nature doesn't want to give us a kind of automatic set of things we pursue, no less than the natures of other animals, it requires us to get certain things in order to live. And um, so what we need to do is to discover what these things are and pursue them by choice. And what a morality then is, is a code of values accepted by choice. So it's a rationally identified and conceptualized set of a view of what it is that a human being needs that you grasp and uh, apply and guide your life by by choice, which then enables you to survive uh, in the way that um, animals and plants have automatic sets of things they pursue which keep them alive. We need a worked out conceptually and chosen set of things. Um, so that's the kind of background to what Galt thinks morality is. And it leads to the idea that the standard of morality for a human being, or the standard of morality, since morality is a thing for human beings, is what he calls man's life. You might think of it as human life or life as a man. Uh, Carrie Ann, you had some thoughts you no, wanted to? No, no, you have to go very quickly. 
in the rest of the philosophical picture of volition and that we're being uh, that has to choose to think and form concepts to identify the natures of things, most especially ourselves. Yeah. So. Good. So we're we're on the same. But now this is a really difficult topic. This is also Rand's view of how you bridge the is ought gap. And if this was a philosophy course, uh, a kind of straight philosophy course, we could spend weeks on just these couple of paragraphs. Mm -hmm. But the key ideas I think we need to take away, particularly to understand the role of this in the novel, is that morality is a for, is what needs to for what human beings need to play the role of the. Um, genetic or instinctual mechanisms in other living things that directs them towards the sets of things they need to live. But the real thing, reason why we need it is because our tool of survival and the things that directs our action is reason. That lets us act in a much greater variety of ways than animals. It frees us from going through the same cycles over and over again in the way Daphne noticed that animals do. Right? But it also requires us to consciously know and choose our values rather than have this kind of automatic security. And I just wanted to read a, a passage that I think is really important here about why uh, man needs morality. Um, an instinct of self-preservation, Galt asks about. Uh, that's precisely, he says, what man does not possess. An instinct is an unerring and automatic form of knowledge. A desire is not an instinct. A desire to live does not give you the uh, knowledge required for living. Pause there for a moment. So even if human beings automatically desire to live, your desire to live won't guide you to the actions and goals that you need to adopt in order to live. You could desire to live but do all the wrong things and die. But Galt goes on. Even man's desire to live is not automatic. Here he's directly addressing the issue that Axton said Daphne needs to check. Even man's desire to live is not automatic. Your secret evil today is that that is the desire you do not hold. And if we're right that in most of the speech, Galt is not just talking to Jim Taggart and the really evil people, but to society at large, I think what he's saying is a lot of people, most people in this society, don't really want to live. That's not the same as saying they want to die, but they, there's some sense of wanting to live, desiring to live, that they don't have. It's not that they desire it but are wrong about how to get it. That desire isn't formed in them somehow. Even man's desire to live is not automatic. Your secret evil today is that that is the desire you do not hold. Your fear of death is not a love of life and will not give you the knowledge needed to keep it. So people fear death, they don't want to die, but having a desire to live is something over and above fearing death. And to say that it's not automatic is to say there's some kind of achievement or something you need to do to have a love of life. And I think in next week's session when we talk about the, the, the morality of death and why people accept it and how it's preached and so forth, we'll be in a better position to parse out what he thinks about people who don't want to live and in what sense they don't want to live and yet there's something good left within them and so forth. But it's worth noting that Galt's view, if I'm interpreting this right, of regular people is not that they and Galt and Daphne all have in common we want to live and then there's some issue about how we achieve it. Um, that's even ordinary folks, he thinks, lack what the kind of desire to live that Daphne has. Uh, and certainly the really vicious people like Jim, uh, she thinks, lack it. Um, OK. Um, someone, Ben, somebody just put up a kind of longish comment that's interesting, but I can't really read it all. Can you see it? Jacob, yes, I can see it. Uh, do you want to read that? Oh, this is too related to people who would have had to have seen me talk to Iran the other day. Maybe we don't want to go into it here. Yeah, and I have some I have some thoughts on this section that I still want to share apart from this. So I couldn't hear you. Go ahead, Ben. Um, what you want to talk about? Oh, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to tie this a little bit back to the plot uh, and some of the literary uh, aspects uh, of the story so far. So. Um, in particular, so starting with the point about the difference between 
um, living and inanimate things and the role of that in the in forming the concept of value. And it really uh, dramatic. Who would have thought that you could dramatize this kind of abstract meta-ethical point uh, in literature? But it it happened very recently in our story. If you think back to the previous chapter with the death of the wet nurse, where the wet nurse, who's you know non-absolute up until very recently, has been indoctrinated with the idea that man is just a collection of chemicals and there's no meaning in life, and he's sitting there reflecting on it on how, oh no, he's not just a collection of chemicals and that death matters to him. And it would, it would matter to an animal too. Uh, but that there's a difference between him and an animal. It matters in a special way in which it doesn't uh, for an animal. And remember, this is where he's realizing that he's, he really does want to live. Um, likewise, in that same scene as Reardon is carrying him away uh, and reflect, I think right up and right after he's died, uh, Reardon's thinking about how most living creatures teach their young how to use their means of survival and that not all people do. And it's it's as if they were uh, mangling their own uh, children's wings. And here's here's the wet nurse with the mangled wings who never learned how to fly because of what his teachers taught him. Um, and then also on the issue of choice and its role in morality, uh, there's some really great uh, descriptions of how Reardon has chosen every one of his values and and continues to choose to think really early in the book when we get the story of his life and he's always asking himself uh, what what keeps me going who is who is motivated who or what has motivated me to keep going and it's like the scene where he's slumped on his desk and he lifts himself up and he, it's dramatizing the idea. It's him. He's made the choice. And you especially see this in the scene right after the equalization of opportunity bill uh, is passed. And uh, he's facing the same question again. And he gets this idea for combining a trust with an arch where uh, he certainly doesn't have to pursue this idea, but he chooses to think, to focus on it, uh, to, and which helps Dagny uh, build the bridge. And last point, real quick, is that uh, on the topic of why we need morality as a system of principles, um, this is really illustrated in um, the final chapter with Cheryl, where it's, it's quite clear that she wants to live, unlike some of these other people, uh, but that she doesn't know how to, and that she hasn't, um, she hasn't encountered any set of principles that would help her. And this is, of course, the scene that you referenced in the supplemental episode where the traffic lights of society seem to be switched there. We know how to protect our body, but we don't know how to, you know, protect our souls. And it, in fact, they, they following morality that society gives us, puts us, uh, seems to threaten us. It's because it's because it's this morality of death. And she, even though she's had this conversation with Dagny, she's, she, she's not around to hear Galt's speech and, uh, and we see the results. I really uh, agree with all of that. And the, the reference to the wet nurse as non-absolute, um, and he learns an absolute in the, the moment, uh, in the time when he learns how to live, he knows several absolutes now, uh, brings us nicely to the next section of Galt's speech, where he talks about um, his, uh, his morality being contained in a single axiom, just as, just as yours, uh, the society's morality, is contained in an attempt to deny that axiom. Um, and we, uh, later he says that his axiom comes, his morality comes from an axiom and a choice, uh, the axiom we'll talk about now, and then the choice being to live. Um, so the axiom is first, the first way of putting it is existence exists. Um, we could spend a lot of time on on what's meant by existence exists and why why say it. I'll say there's some really good material on that by Jason Ryans in uh, his essay on metaphysics in uh, in a companion to Ayn Rand. There's you know a, a lot of good material on um, the axioms uh, of objectivism in um, uh, probably I mean the best single source on the axioms is. Um, uh, other than you know how I'm answering self treats them, is um, Dr. Peikoff's treatment in the first chapter of Objectivism, the philosophy of Ayn Rand, where he goes through each of each of the axioms. But 
I, I want to also single out um, Jason Ryan's treatment uh, in, in The Companion because it connects it much more to the literary examples of it. And so, um, and that's just, just the genre differences of the book. So if you're thinking of it in connection with Atlas Shrugged, um, uh, look at that. And if you want kind of a lot more chewing of the axiom and how it relates to the rest of philosophy, uh, Dr. Peikoff's chapter one uh, of Objectives in the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. Um, for now, I'll say that what, what we're getting in the idea of existence exists, right, is that what is, is, and it's that way independent of our desires and wishes. Um, there's a kind of absolutism to reality, which um, is captured by the phrase existence is identity, um, which, uh, which Galt goes on to say. What is, is what it is. It has a specific identity. A is A as he puts it, uh, attributing that to Aristotle, and uh, as is the title of the last section of this novel. And consciousness, which is the other axiomatic idea Galt talks about here, the idea that you're aware, is, um, is identification, right? Consciousness's role is to grasp the identity of that which exists. As opposed to what? As opposed to consciousness creating existence. As opposed to things being what you want them to be because you want them, as opposed to you're not seeing something making it not exist. Now, of course, consciousness can alter or change existence in the sense that consciousness can lead a conscious being to take actions, and those actions can have effects, and indeed, morality is all about the types of things we should choose to do with our consciousness to create uh, the effect of our lives. But what the axioms are meant to preserve is this distinction between what you believe, think, want, and what is so. That the world is as it is, you're wanting it or thinking it's a certain way won't make it that way. And you have to make your mind conform to reality to grasp what things are and then make decisions about how to act on the basis of that. And that's what we see the villains in the novel not doing, right? They're non-absolute, they're plastic, they're the fog, A is non-A, they never want to say it is, they never want to commit to anything. And somehow Galt thinks, and this is something, again, we're going to want to talk a lot more about in the later part of the speech, when we talk about mysticism and the villains and so forth, um, the whole morality of death, the whole idea of sacrificing is related to or there's some deep connection between that and wanting things not to be what they are. People are trying to ignore that A is A so that they can ignore that man is man, and they want to have their cake and eat it too, as we've already seen Reardon say. In, and all of this, these attempts to evade identity and reality, are what, um, are what is the source of all the pain and conflict there is in the world. The basic choice, then, thinks Galt, is to... Um, recognize and adhere to this axiom, to recognize that existence exists, that reality is what it is, that things are what they are, and then to act accordingly. Um, or put another way, the basic choice is to choose to live, but for a being that lives by reason, for any being that's conscious, consciousness is its means of survival. And for a human being, reason is its form of consciousness, and reason is volitional. And you're being rational only insofar as you accept this axiom, accept the truth of things are what they are, and now you think about what you're going to do about them. And so this basic choice is, in one sense, the choice to live, but in another sense, the choice to think, the choice to reason, the choice to accept these axioms. And so uh, Galt says that my morality is contained in an axiom and a choice, the axiom that existence exists, and the choice to live. And then he kind of spells out what follows from that, what content of morality follows from that. Uh, yeah, did you want to comment on this? Just, just a question. Mm -hmm. um, do you think the phrase existence exists is the same thing as naturalism? And if not, what's the difference? Uh, I, so the word naturalism is one of these words in philosophy that gets used a bunch of different ways to mean different things. Um, on some of the meanings of it, I think Rand might agree with it. On others, I'm sure she wouldn't. But I don't think on any of them is it the same thing as is meant by existence exists. Um, so we, I think that's something better for us to talk about off line, so to speak, because it's a fairly technical about what does this or that philosopher mean by naturalism. Um, 
Ben, do you have any further thoughts on the meta-ethics and the role of the axioms before we go to the, uh, or do you think we should go to the virtues and values at this point? Uh, just one uh, or two, uh, again, uh, comments back on how certain things are dramatized literarily. So the, the point about how existence is identity, that everything, that to exist is to be something of a particular nature, I think is really important when you go back and take a look at the scene between James and Cheryl, uh, where, you know, James uh, is, this is the, one of the last scenes we see between James and Cheryl, and uh, James is explaining what he wants out of life and how he wants his, his unearned uh, respect and love from her. And she says to him, you want to be a man like Hank Reardon without the necessity of being anything, without the necessity of being. And what Cheryl seems to be uh, understanding there is, is precisely this, this connection between existence and identity, which is presumably one of the things that she's been rebelling against when uh, she, she thinks that uh, James and his pseudo-intellectual friends see the universe as nothing but goo. And that connects, importantly, to the question Ben's frozen. I wasn't sure if he was frozen or if my computer was, uh, right when he was talking about goo. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I would, oh, he's back. Did I turn into goo? Hi, ben. Well, I was going to, you turned into stasis. I guess it's the opposite of goo. You turned into what, um, what Parmenides thought identity had to be like, which was no motion. And uh, anyway, go on, pick up from goo. Well, I'm not sure what the last thing you heard me say was, uh, but... You mentioned Jim, Cheryl being uh, upset about Jim and his friends wanting things to be goo. Uh, I think that's the last thing I said, yeah. And, and so then this is... The, the, oh, and then uh, the, this also connects to the question of whether James wants to live, because if to live is, is to exist... And to exist is to be what you are, a certain kind of thing, a human being. And James doesn't want to accept the requirements of being a human being. That's part of what plugs into the answer to the question of whether he really wants to live. Because he can't live as a plant. He can't live as an animal. He can't live as a god. Uh, and so what is there but a man to live as? And if he doesn't want that? Yeah, to, if you, to, want to, be, to not want to be anything is not to want to be, as Galt, as Galt says. Um, so let's talk about uh, the morality is contained in an axiom and a choice. The axiom is that existence exists. The choice is to live. And to live, a man needs three supreme and ruling values, reason, purpose, and self-esteem. Um, reason, we can see why pretty easily. It's the choice. Uh, it's the faculty by which human beings live. Purpose. Um, he describes it as your choice of the happiness that that tool is going to proceed to achieve. Uh, I think we'll talk more about that in connection with some of the virtues and in connection with the choose life section later. But the idea is if you don't have automatic goals, if your goals are come up with by reason, then you have to just not just value having a faculty of reason, but having that faculty of reason select and direct you towards goals and those goals cohering together into a life. And then the third of these values is self-esteem which is the conviction that you're capable, that your mind is capable and worthy of living, basically. Now, we're going to talk a lot about self-esteem next time because that's a major theme in both the discussions of um, the morality of death and what problems it causes and why people fall into it, and also in the discussion of choose life. So I, I don't think we shouldn't say too much of it next time, but we should make sure any questions or thoughts people have about self-esteem we get back to next time. I'd like to spend the rest of the time we have today, or most of the rest of it, talking about the virtues that Galt brings up. And he brings up uh, seven virtues. He thinks uh, the value is what you act to gain or keep. Virtue is the action by which you gain or keep it. Um, the seven virtues are um, rationality, independence, integrity, honest, justice, justice, productiveness, and pride. And rationality is the first of these. Uh, he's already said that man's basic virtue is the act of thinking, the act of choosing to think, that thinking is something we have choice over. 
And this is something we're going to want to keep talking about. But we already had this idea that there's evading versus thinking. Um, we've talked about this in earlier sessions. This is your basic free will thing, Skalt. Right? This, uh, this choice to think uh, or not to think. And the choice to think is the basic virtue. And the basic vice is the opposite of the choice to think. And rationality amounts to this choice to think. Galt defines it as your recognition that existence exists, and then he goes on to spell out more things about it. But um, thinking is recognizing that existence exists, choosing to bring your mind into conformance with existence. Um, and Galt elaborates on rationality, uh, saying that it involves recognizing reason as your only judge of values and guide to action. Uh, and he talks then a lot about concessions to the irrationality and to irrationality and faith as the contrary of, of the virtue of rationality. He says, um, and I just want to note now, but we'll talk about next time, that such concessions invalidate one's consciousness. All right, pretty easy to see how they would do that. If you're being irrational, you can't know that your conclusions are true. But also that they amount to a wish to annihilate existence, which is a little harder to see why just not choosing to think uh, would be a wanting to annihilate existence. Let's hold off on exploring that idea because we get a lot of content on that when we talk about the mystics later in the chapter. But when we do talk about that uh, for next week, we should think in mind, part of rationality is not being like these mystics. This is the contrary of, of rationality. So let's move on now to talking about the, the other virtues which are kind of fleshing out rationality. And um, Jean uh, in the comments noticed something interesting about them which is, um, go, well, first of all, I've pointed, I don't think Gene points this point out, uh, although people have before, that each virtue is defined by Galt as a recognition of a fact. Rationality is the recognition of the fact that existence exists and goes on. It's a kind of complex several facts with uh, dashes separating them. Uh, independence is the recognition of a certain fact when he goes on. Honesty, each one of them is listed as a recognition of a fact. Um, Earlier, Galt says that virtue is an action, the action by which you achieve a value. And he, at that point, says your basic virtue is the act of thinking or choosing to think. So we want to think about how this perspective on virtue as an action should relate to virtue as a rec recognizing a certain fact. Maybe it's the kind of action you take when you recognize that fact, or recognizing that fact is itself an action or something. We might want to think about how those two relate. But Jean points out that the things that he names as virtues, rationality, independence, integrity, honesty, productiveness, pride, they sound more like attributes or characteristics or character traits. And in fact, in the history of philosophy, virtues are almost always understood as character traits, not as particular actions you take in a moment, but like states of character, ways you can be, at least going back to Aristotle, and there's a whole discussion of this. And um, it's interesting that, you know, Galt, the things Galt names as virtues sound like character traits, they're the kind of names of character traits, but he seems to be thinking of them as either modes of action or as grasps of facts, or maybe as modes of action taken in recognition of facts, or the action of recognizing these facts. And so... Uh, I think that's just worth noting. There's uh, some really interesting discussion of this. This was a topic that Alan Gotthalf was very interested in, the connection between these ways of describing virtue. And there's, I think, some really good material on that in one of his chapters in uh, one of the books I'm always pitching, A Companion to Ayn Rand, Chapter 4. Um, I'll just say in answer to Gene's question, and anyone else can, can chime in on it briefly if they want, although we'll have to be brief because we need to move on, um, that... Uh, I think Galt and Rand is focused on these things primarily as types of action because it's when you're thinking about them as types of action that you can think about their effects and what role they play in contributing to survival. But, uh, of course, they are types of action that you want to take not just episodically and on occasion, but in general as a habitual thing. they are types of action that involve recognizing and hewing to certain facts they're the, the mode of action in recognition of certain facts. And so that's what the virtue is. And of course, if you do recognize the fact, you normally don't recognize it just in a moment, but as a piece of knowledge that you have and maintain over time. And so you will then act in the relevant way over time. 
The other the fact, just to note about all of these virtues, is that the facts that are being recognized all have to do with the relationship between existence and consciousness, which are the axioms Galt talks about. Um, and there's a lot more we can say about that, but um, I think we have been talking about it a lot in previous episodes, where we're talking about the evil of evading, the kinds of thinking that Dagny and Reardon are doing, um, and uh, sometimes the kinds of mistakes they're making, what Galt has uh, pitched in uh, as the right way to think about your values um, uh, in the valley and what he said about conflicts of interest and so forth uh, has a lot to do with rationality informing your values. But I think well, we might have to do a supplemental episode on value and virtue at some point. Ben, do you have points you want to make about the virtues? Or, sh- or do you think we should move yeah, on? Just a few, uh, a few of them real quick. Uh, one is in response to uh, Jean's question, and that is it's, it's, uh, even though I think she's right that Rand doesn't use the word virtue to refer to a state of character so much, uh, it's not as if she doesn't recognize the issue of uh, importance uh, of enduring states of character. That's what the whole virtue of pride for her is in, in part about. It's about the, the value of creating your own character uh, that is keyed to your values uh, and that brings with it a set of emotional reactions. Um, and I think that's actually an underappreciated aspect of the virtue of pride. Um, really good point. One other, a few other, yeah, one other point is just about uh, reason, purpose, and self-esteem, which are not virtues, but they're, she describes them as ruling values. Um, in another essay, uh, well, in one of her nonfiction essays, The Objectivist Ethics, she actually she pairs those three values with three of these virtues and has a slightly different uh, organization. She pairs reason with rationality, purpose with productiveness, and uh, self-esteem with pride. And I just wanted to point out that I sometimes like to think of these three cardinal values and the corresponding virtues as, as well paired with uh, the three leaders of the strike. Uh, Ragnar, Francisco, and Galt. Uh, Ragnar is the philosopher who rebels against the, his, his bishop father who believes in faith and goes to war against uh, the use of force. Francisco is the prodigious producer uh, uh, who's always asking what for, what's the purpose. And Galt is the embodiment of self-esteem. He goes on strike uh, you know, in, in favor of uh, of self-esteem, and he's the one who has the pain, the face without pain or fear or guilt, and who refuses to uh, accept the role of a sacrificial animal. So, uh, think those three characters when you think those three values. Not that they don't have the other ones either, but they get these get singled out in certain ways. This point about different characters emphasizing different virtues is also something Alan talks about in. Uh, the chapter in the game. He doesn't make that point that you just made, Ben, which I think is interesting about the three first strikers and the three values, but the particular one of Galt being particularly connected with pride um, and, and Francisco with purposiveness is uh, is there, and I think it's, it's a good point. Um, I think probably we should at some point have a uh, maybe a supplemental episode or something on virtue I'm not sure. We'll have to think about when to do it because there's so much to say here. Um, we're almost at the end of our time, so uh, I think we're going to have to hold off on the morality of death stuff for next time. But I want to just say something about what we get at the end of the morality of life. Um, Ben, I should mention I'm not getting audio from you. It's as though your mic was muted or something. So if you're saying something, I can't hear it. Um, but we, there we go. I just heard you again. Okay, good. It's okay if you wanted to be, I just, I wasn't sure if it was a problem or a choice. Um, choice being very important in our discussions for today. Um, so the last topic in this portion of the speech, uh, and this is also something we're going to have occasion to, uh, that is the last topic in this, um, part two of the speech, the morality of life is also a topic that comes up a lot again later in the speech. And we'll talk about it more later in the speech, but I just want to say a word or two about it now, which is the principles by which human beings should interact with one another. And um, Galt, I just wanted to name uh, name a few of them. So there's first what Galt calls the traitor principle. This is the principle of 
interacting with others by trade, value for value, rather than mooching or looting from them. And we've seen this principle you know, throughout the novel, people are referring to themselves as traitors. It was um, really driven home in Francisco's money speech, and Reardon says I'm a traitor, and Dagny says I'm a traitor. So I think we can just, just mentioning it here in this context will evoke all of those past discussions we've had of it. Um, the other one is the special evil of initiating force, the evil of, uh, of exercising force against people, the evil of looting rather than just mooching. Um, a moocher you can just walk away from. They beg you and you say, no, I don't want it. If you don't accept the moocher's uh, false values that lead them to mooch from you, you don't have to give them anything. But the looter is the person who doesn't let you walk away. He's the one who pulls a gun or issues a threat to you. And Galt's view is that's the one thing you have to renounce to live in society, right? The one thing you have to renounce is the ability to use force. You have to say, if I disagree with people, we're each going to go our separate ways, and we're not going to deal with one another by force. Uh, and therefore, he gives, the strikers give the world here an ultimatum, our work or your guns. In a way, what Galt is on strike against is their whole moral code. But if they just held their moral code kind of privately and begged them for stuff, but didn't pull the gun when they didn't give them it, then they would be able to exist out in the world among them and wouldn't be threatened by them. Now, in fact, Galt thinks the nature of their moral code is such that they can't live by it peacefully. It will lead them to want to um, use guns. But the place where the rubber hits the road, so to speak, and where the, therefore there's this ultimatum that's issued is our work or your guns. We will not live under compulsion. That's why you know, we, won't, we cannot deal with you. And the last point from this section of the speech, which I just want to mention, as a transition to what we're going to talk about next time and as a um, connection to something else in the book, is Galt thinks that the whole idea of trying to rule people by force is connected with zero worship or the worship of pain, with the view of life that we saw in Philip Reardon. So uh, recall Philip Reardon, Hank Reardon noticed, um, doesn't think that Reardon feels, that Hank Reardon feels, because all Philip Reardon recognizes is pain in the absence of pain, not joy. And what Galt says we on the morality of life are trying to do is not live to get away from fear, to get away from death, to get away from pain, but to try to achieve something, to try to achieve joy. But if you're trying to rule people by force, your force can't incentivize them to joy. All it could do is cause pain or remove a threat. And so um, the idea that this is the right kind of incentives to deal with people with, that it's the strongest kind of incentive, that it's really the most practical way of dealing with people is by force and by fear, the way that Thompson tries to deal with the whole engineering profession when suddenly none of them can fix his radio, um, comes from the view that, um, at least Galt thinks it comes from the view, that... Uh, that we saw Philip Reardon as an exponent of. Ben, any thoughts uh, you want to add tie-ins on the virtues and values section or on this trader section? Uh, or, I mean, uh, no, but I have... Point, so. I did want to make a quick point or two about the force stuff that you just mentioned. Um, there's two paragraphs in uh, this section on uh, page, uh, page 1023 that, that bring to mind, again, some, uh, some of the real characters from the story. Uh, there's a paragraph where Galt talks about how interposing the threat of physical destruction between a man and his perception of reality is to negate and paralyze his means of survival, how it's using forces acting like a killer acting on a premise of death in a manner wider than murder, destroying a man's capacity to live. This really brings to mind for me the scene right after the passage of the Equalization of Opportunity Bill, where Reardon's mind is basically paralyzed. He's thinking about everything he was just planning on doing with his ore mines. And now there's no point in his even thinking about this. Uh, and he, he himself thinks of it in terms of parts of his life being stripped away uh, because of that. And then the paragraph that follows that immediately, uh, do not open your mouth to tell me that your mind has convinced you of your right to force my mind. Force and mind are opposites. Morality ends where a gun begins. When you declare that men are irrational animals and propose to treat them as such, you define thereby your own character and can no longer claim the sanction of reason. It's, it's like he's got to be speaking there to Stadler. 
because Stadler, of course, can, you know, explicitly thinks of other people like animals and thinks you can't deal with them by reason. And he's the one who's endorsed the establishment of the State Science Institute. And this is why Galt condemned him, because he had claimed the sanction of reason for himself, and Galt is revoking it. Uh, and, of course, it's, it's symbolic then uh, toward the end that the result of this is Project X, which is this, which is itself... I mean, it's no longer just that taxes are being used to support the State Science Institute. It's that this massive weapon is now uh, being pointed not only at uh, all of society, but at Stadler himself. Good, thanks. So we're, um, I'm just going to, I guess I can only switch to just the shot of me because it's the only one I can get this uh, image in it. So we've made it through tonight the introduction uh, of the speech and the morality of life section, uh, so the first two sections of the speech. We've, um, we're tr giving them very short shrift based on how, how compared to how much material is in here. And really, you'd need to do a whole course on this speech, um, maybe not quite as long as this uh, whole Atlas project, but you know, weeks on it, and particularly if you want to do connecting it to the novel, each of these are deep, and difficult philosophical points that have whole histories in the history of philosophy, how they're like and unlike uh, standing opinion. There's just so much to say about them. We've been trying to emphasize points that are particularly salient to the plot points and character points we've been talking about. We'll have a lot more to say next week about the morality of death, about the teachers of it, about the issues involved in choosing life over death. Um, and maybe we'll have some supplemental sessions either soon or towards the end of the, the project. We'll do some after we're done with the whole novel, um, returning to some of these themes in detail. But um, we're going to post, Ben, some um, more questions in Thursday as we do that focus on the issues towards the end of the speech, right? Uh, some of them are also going to have connections to issues earlier on. I think did we decide that we were going to leave some of the questions that are already there open in case people want to follow up on them, or are we closing them? I don't remember if we decided it, but but we might as well decide that now. Uh, maybe maybe we should leave them open. I think I think a lot of the philosophical questions have yet to be digested much, so I'm I'm in favor of leaving them up. We'll leave this week's questions up, along with next week's questions, which more focus on the end of the speech, and. Um, I think since we're over time, that's it for tonight, but we look forward to talking about the rest of John Galt speaking with you guys next week. Thank you. See you all there soon. <laughs>